Hello, everyone. This is Adam Meister, the Bitcoin Meister, the Disrupt Meister. Welcome to the One Bitcoin Show. Today is August the 14th, 2018. Strong hand. One Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. Value your wealth in Bitcoin. Offended by selling. Bitcoin is the next Bitcoin. Be a unique beast. Holder of last resort, world reserve cryptocurrency, don't FOMO on altcoins. All right, we're doing it a little different today on the uh, One Bitcoin show. We got a special guest coming in from Romania. Vlad Coste is here. And- uh, Hi. Hey, man. Vlad, you've writ you, you guys have probably read about him in uh, Bitcoin Magazine. He writes for Bitcoin Magazine. He's got his podcast with a really cool name. What's your podcast called again? It's got an awesome name. Yeah, The Bitcoin Takeover. The Bitcoin Takeover. I love it. Pound that like button. All right. So I, I, like, I like your writings, man. You write Bitcoin Magazine, best publication out there. They're hardcore into Bitcoin. Um, there are a lot of ridiculous stories on other publications uh, covering all sorts of drama. Uh, but you guys, you cover like the hardcore technical stuff. How did you become, and I don't want to be presumptuous here, but are you a Bitcoin maximalist? Oh, well, that depends on how you define the term. In the sense that I would only invest in Bitcoin, then yes. In the sense that I disagree that experimentation with other protocols is damaging for Bitcoin, I don't think so. You can experiment with lots of protocols and lots of projects to be sure what would happen if you were to implement that specific line of code into Bitcoin. So I, I guess altcoins can be useful for research purposes, but I wouldn't recommend anything as a financial asset and nothing of what I say is financial advice because personally, I, I'm not very good at trading and I know you had Tone Vase in the show. So watch that episode with Tone, just forget about everything that I say about money. Well, I, I like your perspective on a Bitcoin. Definitely. I, I have to agree. If, if that's what a Bitcoin maximalist is, I think uh, I, I like, I like that definition. I think some are much more hardcore. They will want, they don't even think altcoins are experiments. They think they're just scams. But again, I, my, my thing, and I don't give financial advice, um, but I, I only buy Bitcoin, of course. And this is the Bitcoin master show. Pound the freaking like button people. Now with all, with all that said, um, in terms of your, your writing, it, it is about uh, Bitcoin related stuff. You covered the bit piggies thing. And I, I meant to mention this uh, off the air to you, but I, I met Jim before actually, the guy behind bit piggies. Um, and I, I, got, I give you guys credit. I mean, it's, it's a simple concept, but you, uh, you, you brought it to, to the attention of, of many more people. So uh, do, do you have any thoughts on that uh, concept? Uh, the bit piggies having a, a piggy bank getting kids into it early? I actually had the idea presented by Christy, who is the editor in chief at Bitcoin Magazine. And BitPiggies was one of the items which was sold during the Bitcoin 2019 conference in San Francisco. And they wanted to have this type of interview. But prior to me joining Bitcoin Magazine, I interviewed Jim mm -hmm. for my podcast. And I knew of him and I saw that the topic was being pitched, but nobody picked it up. And I said, you know, I can actually take this and turn it around and give it some kind of interesting twist. Because at the time, I was also researching into skeuomorphisms, which is a concept that basically means that you take something physical and put it into something virtual. And for example, think of the first versions of the iPhone where you had app icons which resembled very specifically the applications that they were having that correspond in real life. You had the library application which would appear like a shelf on which you choose your media. And I was thinking that BitPiggies does the exact opposite. Take something which is natively digital but puts it in the physical world and makes it make sense for young children. Yeah, that is all, that is a great way of looking at looking at it. Taking something that is digital and putting it into the physical world, 
And it, it's a basic cotton. More people should try something like that. I think it's a, I think it could really catch on. And that is a very, what was the original term that it, it's the reverse of that? Uh, you just Geomorphism. S-K-E-W-M-O-R-P-H-I-S-M. All right. We're, we're learning new stuff here on the show. I like this. I like this. Okay. Now, something else that you're covering, which is, I get asked these kind of questions all the time. Uh, Decentralized exchanges, uh, and uh, you're, you're, I have played around on BISC. I don't know if you have it all, but you have, you have played around on HODL HODL though. So uh, is there, what do you have to say about HODL HODL and is there a big difference between the two and your take on decentralized exchanges? I'm actually lucky enough to have interviewed both the people from HODL HODL and a representative from BISC. And I know that in pure terms, if we were to, define decentralized it's only BISC that is truly decentralized as it doesn't have a central authority which governs it they just have some developers which write code and from that point on you just connect through Tor to a network where you get on the marketplace and from there you just make a peer-to-peer exchange whereas in the case of huddle huddle they take advantage of a jurisdiction which allows them to keep the business running without any kind of issues. I guess they are based in the Cayman Islands or something. And they have the central point of failure in the sense that it's run by two or three people. But at the same time, it's users who post offers and the transactions are peer to peer and there is only a 0.3% fee, which they have to pay to huddle huddle for this convenience. It basically takes away the power that centralized exchanges have and allows people to transact in a way that doesn't require any kind of trust. And they use a multi-sig, a two out of three, where Huddle Huddle holds one of the keys, one of those shards of the private key for the transaction. And it's only settled when both of the parties involved are happy about the outcome. All right. So do you see, <laughs> do you see these decentralized, uh, well, you say only one is truly decentralized. Do you see uh, decentralized exchanges uh, getting uh, more popular in the near future or are people going to have to learn the hard way and are they going to become easier to use anytime soon? I hope so. The, I'm not entitled to make any kind of predictions. I don't have any kind of data to reveal right now. But I spoke to Max Caden of Huddle Huddle. Actually, it was through writing, and I got some comments for, from him for the article which I posted yesterday. And he said that the number of users is increasing in Huddle Huddle, which means that there is a, an incoming number of new users who require this type of peer to peer transactions, which are much more cypherpunk than the idea of holding your coins in a centralized bank like coinbase yes. and I, I hope so that it becomes more popular otherwise we will just have centralized exchanges and if you want to go peer-to-peer -peer, you're just going to get on some some type of irc channel or forum where you trust that people are okay and will not try to kill you or torture you until you give them your private keys yeah. and you meet in person and you're going to do this kind of swap for cash. I guess that's the only other alternative, which is much more confidential than anything involving bank accounts. Now, you did say that one key word in there, trust, and uh, it, thus showing it's not a trustless uh, uh, system that, uh, you know, when, when, you, when you have to meet the person in, uh, when you have to meet the person in person, you got to trust they're not going to stab you. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's an ass big ass there so we, we we do hope that uh it, that the online uh these decentralized can become as, as trustless as, as possible I, uh one can hope now uh it, you you cover a, a, some t some tech issues and you've got a tech head on you there definitely what what's your take on uh, a lot of people are very excited about the financialization of bitcoin does that interest you at all all the the big uh, financial institutions that are supposedly coming into the space I mean, that's usually nice and it's pleasant to have this warm and fuzzy feeling of not, not being alone and crazy and all of this big space. 
but at the same time, it's not mandatory for them to get in in order for to become popular into the game. But other than that, I don't really see the purpose. Okay, so uh, Bitcoin doesn't need uh, like uh, financialization. Use Bitcoin because they need it mostly. They need money that cannot be confiscated and cannot be centralized and cannot be inflated. Otherwise, they can just use the dollar and be completely happy. And most people get into Bitcoin at first because of speculation. And it was also my case. And I got wrecked because I, I had no idea what I was doing. But in my case, it, it turned out to be just fine because I ended up reading books and studying the phenomenon and actually getting a job to write about it, which is incredible. Yes, it is. When did you get into it, by the way? Well, I first heard about it in 2014 when I was in Paris studying at university. And yeah, I had to make a class presentation about blockchain at the time. And the only eloquent and clear example for blockchain was Bitcoin. And I basically had to explain to my class what Bitcoin is. But I didn't buy any at the time. And I wasn't very sure about what I have just learned because it seemed so complicated. And I only had a few days to learn the information and basically make my presentation and know what to say. And I read an article in Wall Street Journal at the time. And it just presented the whole Silk Road situation and predicted that Bitcoin was going to die. And I was going to this kind of university, which was very tied in close ties with the banks in the sense that we have always learned that the banks are honest and the banks are nice and it's them who we should trust, basically. And when I read that in the Wall Street Journal, there, were, there was no way for me at the time to think otherwise and to actually contest that. But I got into Bitcoin in early 2017, I guess. But uh, I got into Ethereum first and I got wrecked with that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it was exactly what I needed to hear around the time that you decentralize the internet, you build a world computer, which is able to run any application in a decentralized way. When I heard that, I was blown away. It was everything that I ever dreamed of wrapped in a nice package in which I could invest. Like, okay, take my money, please. <laughs> But yeah, I got this illusion pretty fast. <laughs> Grew out of it. But it led you to Bitcoin. It led yes. you to the right spot. Do you think there is a future uh, for Ethereum? You know, speaking of Tone Bayes, you said it was just on the show last week. Uh, he, he doesn't think there's a future. <laughs> what about you for Ethereum? It's hard for me to think there is any future given the fact that there's nothing special about it, really. You, it can be inflated. I mean, it has an unlimited supply, okay. But they used to have this plan for a certain percentage of new coins getting in. And they just kept on delaying the difficulty time bomb to the extent that I think right now they have more than 100 million ETH, which was mine, which Vitalik said that wouldn't happen back in 2016. But now it happened and they are over 7 million above the 100 million threshold. So in this regard, it's not predictable. It's just like a central bank. And the fact that it can run smart contracts and it has that Turing completeness, I mean, that can be done with any other protocol. They just have the first mover advantage because they were the first of the kind to be released. But right now with Taproot and Schnorr, and all the improvements that they're bringing into Bitcoin for smart contracts. I guess part of the companies which invested in Ethereum, and we have already seen it with Microsoft, are going to move back to Bitcoin because they see it as more robust and more sustainable on the long term. It makes much more sense for them to invest into something that will be around in the next 10 years, as opposed to something which gets crashed by crypto kitties and then goes through a whole existential phase where they're trying to figure out what they should release first and when they should transition to proof of stake and when they should have plasma and sharding and Raiden and DeFi and whatever. 
Man, you're saying all the catchphrases there. DeFi, oh God. <laughs> hey, people, people buy into it. It's the free market. This is where the big boys play. We shall see what happens. But I, I do like your take on that. Uh, everybody, remember, Vlad's link is below. Uh, you can follow him. Please follow him there. He, he's tweeted out some of the stories recently and his thoughts. What are some big stories out there that people aren't talking about? And, and maybe some stuff that you're covering that you're about to debut. And the floor is yours. Right now, I'm working on an article about different types of Lightning routing, because it might seem obvious right now that the Lightning Network has been deployed on the main net, that we have a type of routing which works and is scalable. But developers already think about more scalable ways, which can create greater advantages for the parties which are transacting. And one of the approaches is ant routing. And they basically took the idea from ants, which when they look for food, they disperse. They go in their separate ways and they leave pheromones behind. And basically, that's their way of knowing where each one of them has been. And whichever of them finds most food, they know how to get there because they have the smell of pheromones. And the idea is similar. I mean, there's a French team which works on this, and I have been watching their presentations, and I'm supposed to research on it. And I guess I have to contact them and ask some questions because it, it exceeds my technical understanding of what's going on. Okay. But the idea is that when Alice and Bob are transacting, they set a certain fee because in the future, it's, it's not expected that Lightning will be as cheap as it is now because it's getting more centralized and it's likely that channels will basically say, if you want to route through me, then you're going to pay this kind of fee. And basically, Alice and Bob will be able to establish what kind of fee they want to pay. And this type of ant routing will search through the entire network and find the fastest and the cheapest of the routing methods to be sure that they use the node which gets the money there the fastest and the cheapest, according to whatever inputs they set. Excellent, excellent. Well, there people love on my show to hear this Lightning Network inside info. So, and I, I'm, I'm not privy to this kind of stuff, so I'm glad you're doing the research. I know Aaron covers this stuff a lot too, um, Van Weirdum. Or, or, yeah, I actually got the topic from him because he didn't have time to cover it. So I basically inherited it. Well, that, that is awesome that you can take over an, an Aaron's story because he is, he is great also. And he is a hardcore Bitcoin guy, which you also uh, definitely uh, uh, appear to be. Uh, I want to ask and I want to remind everybody, pound that like button if you like it when we get a guest on the show like this. This is awesome. Your first time on the show. I love it. New, bring, I'm bringing you the best freaking guest in the space, people. You never know who's going to show up here. Now, there is... <laughs> I, again, I love the news that you guys cover over there, uh, but there's a lot of clickbait stuff at so many other publications. And I mean, if you just have a story that says like Bitcoin to a million dollars or some technical analysis chart, I mean, it's going to do just amazing in terms of, <laughs> in terms of uh, attracting people. What's your take on the state of uh, crypto media today? And is there, do you have a favorite FUD story that's out there or a, or a favorite uh, ludicrous uh, pumpage story that's out there? Well, before getting to Bitcoin Magazine, I have worked for Crypto Globe, which was my first gig. And in there, I guess it wasn't as rigorous in terms of reviewing the content. And if you had something which was, I don't know, sometimes we used to joke that we were turning into BuzzFeed because we were trying to keep the standard high and write something good. But at the same time, we noticed that if the content was, I don't know, more clickbaity and more accessible to the masses who are just looking for pumps and reasons to feel bullish about certain coins, then they were getting like 10 times more views. And at the end of the day, they figured out that they're a business and they should be operating through this compromise, which they haven't taken to an extreme like CCN, for example, which I think is the lowest denominator and they're not the only ones. But I like to think that CCN is like an assembly of shitcoiners. I hope they have changed 
But last time I checked the website, they had a politics section just for the sake of the fact that they sound kind of like CNN sometimes. And they added politics just to, I don't know, broaden their audience or something, which makes no sense to me at least. They, they are going to say something, oh, but politics is important for regulation in the cryptocurrency space, which I, I disagree. They don't cover specifically the topics which are about regulation. They just write clickbaity stuff about Donald Trump. <laughs> So yeah, it's just to get, it's just pure clickbait. It's clickbait when they write about Ripple. It's clickbait when they write about Donald Trump. And, and this, this seems to be the, uh, uh, with so many uh, people out there are based their, uh, their, their supposed news around. It's unfortunate. And that's why I like to have people like you on who, you know, you're not trying to get the clicks. You're trying to get the information out there. So that's uh, very, very, very respectable uh, what you're doing. So everybody, it, there, it's the wild, wild west out there in terms of news, in terms of rumors. Uh, again, keep it simple, people. Stick with the Bitcoin stuff. Stick with the Bitcoin. Uh, you start, you know, you start hoping and praying your altcoin is going to do so great. You're you're going to go to these sources that just reaffirm uh, your your false belief, which is uh, it's going to send you down a path of uh, unhappiness in, in the long run. Now, uh, you're in Romania. What's the scene, the Bitcoin scene like over there? Well, you'd be surprised because there was this guy, I'm not sure if you've heard of him, but you have all the reasons to research him. His name is Mircea Popescu. And he was like the Roger Veer of 2010 or something. He mined a lot of Bitcoins. He said to own about 600,000 of them, which is insane. He's like one of the biggest whale, whales after Satoshi. And he built an exchange and tried to do stuff around here. But I hear that he's in Argentina or something. He, he was forced to move for tax reasons. And we also have lots of Bitcoin ATMs, which is surprising. There are lots of places from where you can buy Bitcoin and Ethereum because of a company which is called Bitcoin Romania. And they have basically partnered with all these electronic devices where you can go and pay for your bills and there you can pay your bills with bitcoin or you can actually purchase bitcoin the places where you can withdraw cash by selling them your bitcoin are much more selective and there's only a few of them but you can still find them and the fact that you find all these atms only makes you wonder okay how many people are actually into this in our country it's mostly because we have lots of software engineers and we have very good polytechnic schools and i guess lots of geeks get into bitcoin for various reasons and it also might be the fact that we have an unpredictable kind of economy and inflation and fiscal policy which is just crazy so people get into bitcoin as a safety net they think that this might be the only option that they have so that they don't convert their money into dollars or euro or some kind of currency which they consider to be more stable. But Bitcoin also appreciates in price much more in relation to the US dollar. So maybe that it makes sense for them to huddle some and keep on buying. Yeah. Uh, I, how do you spell that guy's name again? The, the guy who had 600,000 Bitcoin at one point? M I R C E A. Okay. P O P E S C U. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna look that one up. People look that guy up. Uh, he probably does not. If he was like uh, who you said he was like, he probably gave a lot of his Bitcoin away. I would I would think. Back I'm I'm not sure he was kind of crazy about it. He understood what Bitcoin was all about before a lot of people did. It was 2010. I actually looked him up. There's a lot of talk about him on Bitcoin talk. And he had a feud with Gavin and Reeson at some point, which is funny. He has a blog, which is called Trilemma. Okay. Trilemma. I, I'm going to look this guy. I had not. With a single L. Okay. Trilemma with this. Okay. And, and, and what's that? What's it, so? Do you think he still has six hundred thousand Bitcoin? <laughs> Maybe one hundred thousand of them. But he bought a castle at some point, okay. and then 
he saved a, an operating system, which is helpful for Bitcoin mining. Basically, the developers ran out of funding and were about to close down the project. And it was thanks to his donation that they were able to continue because apparently it was like distribution of Linux that is very secure. And that's why they were able to keep on working. And their operating system basically found its purpose in Bitcoin mining. I tried Lemma. He's I'm looking quite at an interesting guy. Yeah, they're very, this is quite, I, I, maybe I had heard of him in the past. I, I don't, it's, it's, I haven't heard about this guy for a while. I, I can tell you that, but this is uh, quite a character that he might have as, he might have as many Bitcoin as the freaking uh, Winklevoss brothers. That's uh, amazing. Now I want to, I would, I want to end this pretty soon because we're getting close to the end with a quote of yours from uh, a recent tweet. And uh, I want your take on your own uh, tweet. Something the Bitcoin community has taught me is that reputation is essential in free markets. If you want to stay around, you have to be honest and do your job right. Definitely not something you find in the normie world where people can act in bad faith with law on their side. Now, I, I do think reputation is important. For people with good memories, reputation, if someone ruins a reputation, they're not gonna to wanna to associate with them anymore. But in this space, in the cryptocurrency space, um, I think people have some short-term memory problems. I think people forget like almost the next day after they hear something bad about someone. I, I think there, there's some players out there that are very questionable individuals and have like cult followings and stuff. So I, in theory, your, your, your take is correct. Um, and I would say among the, 20 percenter producers out there yeah they're they're not going to want to associate with people with bad reputations and if you if you mess up your reputation you're doomed among the productive people uh, i guess which is the most important thing but overall in the space i think a lot of people have gone a lot of different directions and a lot of people have just forgotten about it so i i, I don't know what is uh, do you have any any thoughts on that that there are some people that are getting away with really bad reputations out there well, it all comes back to financial incentives, I guess, or to the fact that, that some people are just foolish enough to follow the money. And that's pretty much it. They don't care about character or morals or any kind of moral compass or values or whatever. I'm tired, but you, you get what I'm saying. They just follow the money. Like uh, right now, I think of Richard Hart, according to the, script, the description that you made. That guy is just a scammer, and I, I can read through his mask. I can see what he's doing to the audience by constantly trying to insult them and trying to act like he's one of them, but at the same time, he's smarter. And I, I was on his show. I was set up by my former boss to be part of the show and promote Crypto Insider, for which I was working at the time. And I just couldn't believe that he basically used me and my face, my image, my voice and everything. We had reasonable conversations. And after that, he started shilling his shit token, which is called Hex or something. Yeah, it hasn't come out yet. Yeah, it's rumored to be coming soon. Yeah. <laughs> and I just didn't want to be rude because I was basically pushed on the show by my boss and I was supposed to be polite and have a decent conversation with him. But after I finished the interview, I felt like it was my duty to clarify that I don't agree with his project. So I wrote an article which was called Why Bitcoin Hex is a Scam. And I started Wait, I all the way from- I that. that was you. All right. <laughs> no, keep going. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. So I started from the way he was treating Ethereum about a couple of years ago when he was saying that it's basically a dumpster fire that cannot be saved because by design it has many flaws. But right now he praises Vitalik on every show that he does and says that he's some kind of genius and prodigy who will bring salvation to us all and he invests in anti-aging technology or something so they become immortal at some point which i find silly and childish but whatever richard hart seems to be 
a big believer in this kind of stuff. And after that, he just gradually moved away from the hard Bitcoiner stance that he had and just became this shit coiner who was trying to, at first he wanted to do an, an ICO and then he basically got to the hex idea from other failures that he has had in the past. And I have no idea how about 20,000 people regularly watch whatever shit he produces. And he dresses like a scammer. He talks like one. He pretends to be a billionaire, which he is obviously not, because otherwise, why would he bother? You know, I, I, I will say this. It was interesting you brought him up uh, because you're like, yeah, some people do not really stand for it. At one point, he was on my show because he was this great Bitcoin believer, you know, going to 20K and everything like that. And it was, and then when it, when it hit me, he, when Bitcoin went down, he totally like had a, a panic attack or something like that. He gave up on it. I'm like, oh, that's, I'm done with this too. I am done with it. But then what's shocking to me and how this is tied into the original uh, quote of yours is how many people still like ask me questions about him or, or like, and take him seriously. I can't believe anyone takes him seriously. I really, because he just switched, just like you said, he went from saying Ethereum was a joke to the complete op. I mean, what do you, what do you stand for? Uh, is, the, is, is the question out there. But there, again, people, uh, the 80%ers, do not, they don't care. They just want the hottest, the latest thing. I guess follow the money, whatever way you want to state it. But they, they have very short memories and, or maybe they don't, they don't consider that a, you know, when someone was ripping on Ethereum before and then praising it later, it doesn't matter to them. Everybody can, what's ever convenient. What's, I mean, I guess some people just like uh, convenience over, you know, actually standing for something. But uh, it's interesting that you bring him up. I, I, I had no idea you were going to do that. So it's so, a so very, very good, very good uh, tie in. There. I actually never had the chance to explain this. I spoke to somebody else during their podcast, but I... At the time, I was refusing to talk about it because I was feeling like Richard Hart could sue me for this. And I, I honestly don't want to get in this kind of situation. It's not in my interest. I have nothing to make out of it. Uh, I'm just going to lose much more time. But I, I don't understand why people still follow him, given the fact that he has a bad record. And... Because, I don't know. because there's the 80%ers, project, but... 80 percenters don't care about reputation. They, they do. I mean, it would be a great world if reputation was uh, essential to everyone. Uh, but it, it is, it's not essential to everyone, un, un, unfortunately. All but right. In, well, let's, in, let's, uh, let's, example, let's, end, example, let's end it with a good note here. Anything, uh, anything else you want to bring up? Uh, uh, just the floor is yours. I don't think I have anything specific that I want to bring up except for the fact that I also want to post this on my podcast and maybe make it a crossover episode because I feel like we had a productive conversation which didn't quite stay specifically on the path of, you know, Bitcoin stuff and we talked about some scammers. <laughs> but other than that, I feel like it was pretty good and I'm happy that he invited me. Yeah, man, you never know what's going to happen here. I, I, it has been an adventure having you on the show. I love the unpredictability, and uh, you never know what's going to come up here. Well, everyone, pound that like button. Check out Vlad's link before below. You're going to hear this on his podcast also, which is great. I love that we're doing a cross-promotional thing here. I'm Adam Meister, the Bitcoin Meister, the Disrupt Meister. Subscribe to the channel, like the video, bang that bell button, click on those squares. Uh, new show every day. Follow me on Twitter at TechBalt, T-E-C-H-B-A-L-T. Thanks a lot, Vlad. Thanks a lot, everyone. See you guys on Thursday. Bye-bye.